and welcome to the Responsible Research and Innovation Project. My name is Steve Miller and I work here at University College London where I'm the Principal Investigator on the RRI Tools Project. And with me today is UCL's Vice Provost for Research, Professor David Price, and we're going to be discussing what responsible research and innovation might mean for one of the world's leading universities. So, David, thank you very much indeed for taking the trouble to be with us today. Um, UCL has quite a tradition of orientating its research towards what you would call global challenges. Could you say a bit about those and why you think it was important that UCL did turn its face in that direction? Well, UCL is one of the, the, the leading universities in the world. We, we, we enjoyed the strapline of London's global university. And as such, when I became Vice Provost for Research, I felt it was essential that we not only were a university, we ought to be able to articulate what it is that we do on a global scale. So we created the, the grand challenges to ensure that UCL was more than the sum of its parts. So the grand challenges that we, we've initiated, first was global health, secondly was sustainable cities, thirdly intercultural interaction, and more recently human well-being. And some of the things that we've been doing, for instance, is to set up commissions with the Lancet to look at the effect of, say, of climate change on global health, or how we can develop healthy cities, and we've been trying to address some of these bigger questions by bringing together subgroups of UCL's activity, uh, active staff uh, from time to time. So one of the new demands on the research community is that they should be involved in responsible research and innovation. So where do you think there is more work to do? Where are the particular challenges for a university like University College London? Well, UCL, I think, has always been guided by some very strong you know, ethical principles dating back to the founders being inspired by Jeremy Bentham. So I think academics at UCL are always aware of the wider implications of their research. So UCL's research strategy has three parts to it. First and foremost is leadership, which is requiring all researchers to be doing something at the cutting edge. The second element is the cross-disciplinarity, so that we are more than the sum of our parts. But the third part of our research strategy is impact. And for UCL, impact means a variety of things. It means scholarly impact, it means pedagogical impact, it means enterprise and, tr and uh, translational impact, but also it means public engagement and public policy. And we've already enshrined that within our strategy, and we're in the process of developing, I think, the effective tools to enhance our public engagement, public policy activities, to be as, if you like, as uh, widely uh, distributed as our enterprise activities. So if you say UCL is in the process of developing this activity, where do you see the big challenges? What more needs to be done, do you think? Okay, well, we'll say in the area of public policy, for instance. We've set up recently lots of interactions with Whitehall to ensure that we can speak to policymakers in a language that they understand. We're not looking to solve political problems. This is more looking at policy landscape, but it's important for us to be able to communicate the insights that we have from research into a language which policy makers can understand and utilise. Likewise in public engagement we've got a variety of activities happening at UCL which are very effective in outreach through collections and museums in the more traditional areas, but also again we're, we're sponsoring research projects uh, being led for instance by some of our climate scientists mm -hmm. on how the challenges of communicating the facts around climate change, how they've been actually quite difficult for the climate science community globally, as we've all seen, and how we can actually understand and learn from that about future communications challenges of globally significant problems. One of the issues that we're looking at in the RRI Tools project is uh, gender equality. Now, just recently, I think you've been involved in uh, UCL having to stand up for some of its uh, women scientists uh, with respect to a national newspaper. Could you say a bit about that? Yes, I mean, it's very unfortunate, but occasionally in parts of the press you get statements which belittle the roles of women and also in this case um, 
colleagues from, from different ethnic backgrounds. And I felt it was really important to highlight the, the fact that the people who were speaking on the scientific problem which was under discussion, who happened to be women, they happened to be non-European origins, that that was irrelevant. They were there because of their scientific insights and knowledge. I am delighted to say that we've been making some very senior female appointments in, in management in the last few months at UCL, but it is just a one step at a time. But I'm convinced that we have seen a breakthrough in the number of PhD students, the number of postdoctoral researchers coming from those uh, different backgrounds. But I think part of the challenge is to get through that career, early career stage from the postdoctoral state into if you like, the more traditional part of the academic structure. It still remains a challenge for us, I think. And you also mentioned public engagement. How far do you think the public ought to be involved in areas, for example, around governance of research? I think that is quite challenging because in order to make judgments on some of these things, you have to, do, you have, to have quite a deep understanding of the problems. And there is a danger of moving towards a popularist democratisation of science. And I think someone famously said that science isn't democratic. You know, somebody's got the right answer just because 99% of the other people actually don't agree, eventually the truth will out. But I think at the end of the day, you still have to have a degree of peer, peer assessment in these processes. And I suppose another pressure on the university is something like the demands of open access. I mean, what's UCL doing as far as that's concerned? Well, open access is something we're totally committed to. Uh, for a number of years, we've had a mandate requiring open access, but that's, shall we say, not been uniformly observed. So I actually welcome um, the principle of requiring open access, which has now been brought on us by HEFKE and the research councils. But UCL has... Um, in UCL Discovery, one of the most effective depositories in the UK. We have um, over a million downloads from that every year, and we're increasing the proportion of material on that which is open access at a significant rate at the moment. So it's something which we are working on at UCL and we're committed to. And likewise, open data as well. We've just invested institutionally £2 million in a huge... Uh, multiple petabyte uh, storage facility for open data to be compliant with the Research Council's requirements. That data which is generated by research grants and used in publications should be available for 10 years beyond their last use. It's essential to have commitment right at the very highest levels. But what do you think the main barriers are to getting that all the way down to the lab bench? Well, you know as well as I do, Steve, that researchers like to do stuff. <clears throat> they like to think about stuff, but they're not terrifically good at tidying up afterwards. Mm. And I think the biggest challenge is for a researcher to do the experiment, write it up, get it submitted, and get it accepted. And then that very last stage of submitting the manuscript to the depository, well, that just slips off the agenda. Um, and Hefke is introducing the requirement that for future ref activities, papers have to be available as on um, downloadable um, open access with effect from um, 2016. And I'm thinking also of the other aspects of responsible research and innovation, so public engagement, um, gender equality, ethics, embedding yes. ethics right throughout the research agenda. I mean, what are the obstacles, do you think, as far as that's concerned? Because again, we can have some good policies, at a high level, but making sure... So they I, I think it's through. communication and training. But also there's a challenge of time as well. Many researchers, well all researchers, are busy. And so by bringing another item onto their agenda, in some respects you're just adding to the burdens of work that they have to do. So we have to have a mechanism whereby we can communicate effectively and efficiently the ideas that we, need, we wish to, to get over. So one of the challenges I think that uh, we have as an institution is to find a cohort of people whose job it is to outreach and inter interact with researchers in the most effective way. And that's different for different cohorts of researchers. So we have to tune, if you like, how it is that we engage with different parts of the institution. My experience is there's a willingness to be communicated with, 
So the events that we have held on ethics and, and, and research have been well attended, they've been enthusiastically engaged with, but we actually don't have very many resources at the moment to follow up on some of those things, or actually to hold as many events as we need to with the diversity of focus that we need. So we have now, I think at UCL, something like two and a half thousand academic staff, two and a half thousand postdoctoral researchers, and with different backgrounds, some in humanities, some in clinical medicine, they have different questions which are pressing on them, different ethical issues, and you have to present your story in the way that the customer needs to hear it, and that's a challenge. One of the more difficult aspects, it seems to me, of responsible research and innovation is at the innovation end. And I suppose it's always been um, thought of as something of a cop-out that um, researchers will say, well, it's us, up to us to sort of look after the truth, seek after the truth, mm. find out what there is to find out. After that, it's not really our responsibility. Innovators come in, manufacturers come in, commercial interests come in at the point, if you like, that uh, the scientific results are available. So how do you think an organisation like University College in London can get itself involved more with the industry side of things and try to ensure that some of the ethics, some of the considerations we consider to be important come across into that stage, if you like, of the RRI, the innovation side of the project. So I guess that there are two sides. There's one is, at what stage do we if you like, let go of the product as, as it translates from the, the, the research base to, to, to the outside world? And there is this, as you know, this pinch point of the valley of death where, where lots of investment dries up and so forth, and then some things go through the other side. And universities are not in the business of venture capital and, and early, career, early developments of, of products. So we have to think of ways of how we go from the bench to industry or production in a way that we can contain or retain some responsibility for, for that material. Although you know, my colleague Steve Caddick, Vice Provost for, for Enterprise, doing some very innovative things now to ensure that universities, or UCL at least, has more, if you like, control over mm -hmm. some of the products of its, um, of its research going forward. So there's that element. I think there's another is to, to engage with, with established industries to ensure that, if you like, we can work with them to develop ethical developments. So for instance, at UCL, uh, we work with BHB Billiton on the whole issue of sustainable resources. We have major uh, intellectual ideas on how this can be done, both socially and economically which Billiton are also interested in because they need that for the sustainability of their business. They need the confidence of the shareholders and else and other organisations to if you like, ensure that they have a future as well. So we have a shared future together. And this is leading us at UCL also to think about establishing an Institute for Sustainable Global Prosperity because here we are at the beginning of the 21st century as a civilization. and we hope that we'll see the beginning of the 22nd century. It's not intuitively obvious to me that that will happen, but we at the university have the responsibility of thinking about how the global system needs to evolve over the next 60 to 100 years to enable society to be sustainably translated into that period. The RRI Tools project is trying to do something to make the area more understandable for the research community across Europe uh, and in particular to produce some training materials and to give training to researchers. Where do you think the key needs are when it comes to the kind of training and the kind of help that they might need to take this agenda on board? Yeah. Well I think it's the human resource in the trainers because one of the things we've noticed is that the events that we've held have always been well attended and with great enthusiasm. The trouble is that in my office we have essentially half a person who can spend their time on doing this. And I've put in a bid for, for my budget to increase that so if we can start increasing the number of people at UCL who are in a position to mediate and facilitate and enable those training events. 
if we can do that, I think we have a receptive audience and I think we can communicate much more effectively. About so you think we'll be knocking at a bit of an open door? I think so. And I think if we can ensure and reinforce the next generation to be responsible and ethical in everything they do, then I think that will be a very secure future for, for, for the whole sector. David, thank you very much indeed for your time. It's an absolute pleasure.